best in football. Um, Andre will. Um, oh, it is recording. The transcript isn't working. But given that my internet is uh, not working as well as it might, I'm just simply going to hand over to Andrew to take away uh, his. Andrew, all yours. OK, so should I start? Oh. Please. Uh -huh. OK. So, yeah, can you see the demonstration? Uh, OK, yeah. one second, yeah. Uh, so, uh, striking success, how goals shape coach bias. So this is a joint uh, study with uh, Ines Etso, so let's start. Um, so a quick uh, overview of what will be going on. So I'll start with the uh, motivation of our study, of our research, then uh, a quick uh, literature review, then um, uh, an overview of uh, our data set, uh, uh, then uh, uh, the causal inference section. So uh, as a small spoiler, we uh, we implement uh, the Rubin causal model. So uh, there are like three major uh, assumptions. Uh, we'll formulate uh, them as Rubin did, and then uh, we will delve into the peculiarities uh, uh, connected, uh, like uh, which connects these assumptions with the sports economics field. Then uh, we will. Uh, mm, uh, then I'll talk about talk about uh, uh, the choice uh, of the model and uh, like the estimator selection. And uh, finally, uh, results, discussion, and conclusion. Okay, so overall there will be like almost 40, uh, 35 slides. Yeah, so uh, let's start with the motivation. Um, motivation, importance uh, of studying. Uh, we want to highlight the importance of studying coach bias in sports, basically for two reasons. Uh, first, like it's obvious that uh, coach decisions uh, significantly impact team performance. Yeah, and uh, understanding biases can lead to more effective coaching strategies. So uh, uh, this uh, subfield of sports economics uh, seems uh, very useful uh, in terms of uh, applications uh, in various sports. So, uh, like, it's very interesting to study this topic. And uh, there are several gaps in the existing literature. Uh, so, limited focus on short-term factors affecting squad selection. There are many uh, research papers uh, addressing long-term factors. For example, players' characteristics. Um, uh, team uh, performance uh, within the season uh, and uh, how it all affects uh, squad selection. And uh, also there is a lack of analysis on how the type of goals influences uh, coach decisions. So uh, uh, there are a few studies uh, which uh, consider a specific type of goals and uh, uh, their influences uh, on coach decisions, but uh, there are not so many. So we want to uh, uh, consider specific type of goals. And um, for example, how uh, scoring a specific type of goal in the current match uh, affects uh, the coach's decision uh, regarding the starting squad for the next match. So that's our main motivation. And now let's move on to a small literature review section. So uh, the first uh, paper is uh, like addresses uh, the outcome bias in basketball. So the behavioral bias of sports agents has been considered in several studies. And uh, one of these studies is uh, by Meyer, Flapp and Frank, and it examines outcome bias in sports. So what's the context of this research? Um, coaches make decision on team composition after low profile wins or losses. So uh, these guys uh, may uh, like, um, collect uh, a subset of all the games. Uh, so, uh, sorry, they collect the subset with only the games uh, which are low profile wins uh, and losses. And so within this subset, uh, the assumption is that uh, low profile wins uh, differ, differ from uh, low profile losses, uh, mostly by luck. So we can uh, say that uh, there shouldn't uh, be any uh, coaches um, differences in decision making regarding the starting squad for the next match. So the starting squad in basketball, like five players who start the match. 
Yeah, and what are the main findings of this research? Uh, coaches change the squad more when the game ends with a small loss of points compared to a small victory. Uh, and while there is virtually no difference between these scenarios, outcome largely dependent on luck, as I said previously, uh, so this is like an outcome bias. Yeah, and uh, this effect uh, test, uh, was tested for the, uh, the WNBA and college leagues, and also there was a previous study which was tested for the, WN, uh, for the WNBA, uh, oh sorry, for the NBA, yeah. And um, one uh, of the major outcomes of this paper is also that this effect, this uh, outcome bias effect is more pronounced in less professional college leagues. And also that this effect for the WNBA is uh, more pronounced uh, than for NBA. So, uh, like, uh, league, uh, league level matters. Yeah, and another study uh, in which we're interested uh, is uh, a different study by Guerrero and Page, ex uh, which examines the impact of randomness in football on player evaluations and coaching decisions. So, what they did? Uh, so, uh, they, uh, they uh, took the sh uh, a subset uh, of all the shots, uh, and all these shots uh, hit the goalpost. Some of them resulted in goals, uh, others not. So, um, and then, like, uh, another, like, assumption, which seems plausible, uh, that um, uh, go goals, uh, that uh, those shots uh, which became uh, goals uh, don't differ uh, from uh, shots that uh, didn't, become a goal, uh, didn't become goals. Um, in terms of uh, a player rating or something like this. So uh, they can um, implement a uh, different size here. And uh, the main findings are that scoring a goal increases a player's playing time in the next match by 22 minutes on average. And uh, particularly if the goal puts the team ahead, the effect is even stronger, adding almost five minutes. So this research again highlights how luck affects perceptions and evaluations of players. And uh, both of these, uh, both these studies uh, um, took the subset of uh, goals on, or matches uh, to conduct a, like quasi natural experiment. Uh, uh, studies where like uh, a control group uh, doesn't differ uh, at, uh, at all from the treatment group, uh, so to to find the average treatment effect. But uh, in our case, I'll explain it to you later, we can do this simple thing. Yeah, so we will need to use a uh, more, more advanced uh, model. Um, and uh, so this was a small uh, literature review section. And uh, now, like, w w w what do we want to study, actually? A research hypothesis. Um, firstly, like, a little bit vague. Uh, hypothesis, but uh, the type of goal scored in the previous game impacts the coach's squad selection for the next match. But we want to be more specific, like it's not a great deal to make this hypothesis. Uh, so scoring a decisive goal increases the likelihood of appearance in the starting squad for the next game in comparison with non-decisive goals. So uh, what's the definition of uh, a decisive goal? I'll give you it uh, later, yeah. But uh, you can guess, like... Um, um, yeah, uh, so scoring and another hypothesis is that uh, scoring a decisive goal increases the likelihood of appearance in the starting squad for the next game, particularly among weak teams um, and uh, among the goals that had a small likelihood of being decisive. So the first part is uh, like uh, Meyer and Frank about uh, basketball. And uh, the second one um, uh, is a little bit interesting. We will focus on it uh, later. Uh, and last, uh, the last hypothesis, uh, scoring in a way goal increases the likelihood of appearance in the starting lineup for the next match. Uh, so there are home goals, away goals. Uh, why should uh, away goals uh, be, be like more valuable for the, for the coach? Uh, I'll explain it to you later and we'll check this hypothesis. Uh, now let's move on to our dead set. Actually, to understand what's uh, like how how like the study uh, organizes is organized. So uh, our data set uh, covers goals scored in the English Premier League, League One, Bundesliga, uh, Serie A, La Liga, and Russian Premier League, 
This is from 2014 to 2020, uh, sourced from uh, understat.com. Uh, and uh, actually, you can see two summary statistics, two tables. Uh, what's, uh, you might ask me, Andre, what's the difference uh, between these two tables? Well, um, on the left, uh, there is uh, a, uh, a summary statistic uh, table of, uh, for the whole data set. So there are almost uh, 24,000 observations. Each observation is a goal. And for each observation, there are like, many variables, as you can see, and these variables are stick to each of the, uh, observation. Um, and uh, the table on the right is a subset. And this subset is organized in the following way. So to uh, conduct, um, a, uh, so to conduct um, uh, research, like, uh, sorry, to conduct uh, an analysis uh, on, uh, on the effect of a decisive goal. Uh, I'll explain to you later why uh, do we take uh, all these like subsets. But for now, you can like like a spoiler uh, see that uh, in the right table in the right subset we're using uh, only goals scored uh, where there was a draw. For example, two two or one one or zero zero. Uh, the team subsequently won, so a player scored a goal and his team subsequently won the match. And uh, in uh, this subset, we consider only matches where the Sutwas table unit treatment value assumption holds. I'll give you uh, an explanation of what uh, the Sutwa means uh, in uh, the causal inference section, so everybody will understand what uh, we're talking about. Uh, and um, now I want uh, us to um, go through all the variables quickly, so to understand what uh, what what, what, we're, what we are controlling for, what uh, we are looking at. So uh, current home goals and current away goals. Uh, actually, like we can understand that uh, this is um, the number of goals by a home and away teams uh, scored right before uh, the goal was scored. So here's the observation, a goal, and uh, by uh, under these uh, variables we can see the number of goals scored by home and away teams uh, before the moment the goal was scored. Then uh, minute, like when when the goal was scored. Is match home? Is next match home? Like uh, these are the indicators of whether th the current match uh, is home for the team that scored the goal, or and uh, the next for the next match uh, the same. Then x y are the coordinates uh, of the kick uh, from where it was uh, it was made. Then then x g like uh, a metric of uh, the likelihood uh, for a kick, uh, the likelihood of scoring a goal for a kick. Yeah, uh, and then uh, starting previous this and next match. So these are dummies, like binary variables uh, for uh, the uh, for the player. So uh, uh, if, for example, if a player who scored the goal uh, started uh, appeared in the starting squad for the previous match, then starting previous match equals uh, one. Otherwise, zero. Then uh, midfielder forward are the position indicators, also dummies. Uh, as you can see, for example, 16% of the goals uh, are scored by defenders. Uh, player rating, uh, it's uh, the FIFA player rating, uh, standard one. Um, club rating and club rating dynamic. Uh, so uh, what was the difference between these two variables? Uh, club rating is the average rating for club. Uh, based on all these uh, seasons from 2014 to 2020. So, but you can imagine that uh, the, uh, the club strength um, may, may vary uh, among uh, the seasons. So, uh, we uh, chose for the main specification club rating dynamic. So, for uh, it's like a season based uh, level, oh, season based, sorry, season level uh, variable. Um, then winner home team, winner away team, whether a home team won the match or away team. As you can see, wow, uh, home teams uh, usually w win the match. Um, and then Sutva, how many of the observations um, meet uh, Sutva? Uh, and then uh, is decisive goal, uh, what's... Uh, so you can see 13% of the goals are decisive ones. And so a decisive goal, is a goal, then um, one, on one of the next slides there will be a definition, but for now a decisive goal is a goal which was scored again when uh, the score was equal 
and there were no other goals in the match. So, for example, there was a score 2-2, then uh, a player scored the goal, the score became 3-2, and no goals uh, happened after this goal from any of the teams. And in comparison, a non-decisive goal is a goal which was scored when the score was equal, but uh, after the goal, uh, one of the teams uh, scored a goal. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and a decisive goal may seem like a very, um, very valuable goal for for a team because, like, there was a draw and then uh, a player scored a goal and uh, only by this goal uh, uh, the team won. Yeah. Uh, so that's all. Like, if you have any questions um, throughout the presentation, you free to ask, of course. And uh, we uh, move on to the classifications of these variables. So. Uh, we classificate uh, all classify sorry uh, classify all the variables on uh, into three categories ca clusters um, uh, match characteristics uh, key characteristics and player characteristics uh, we will explain the necessity of this classification in the next section but for now like match characteristics are the current score when the goal was scored minute on which the goal was scored uh, whether this was a home match or in a way one and for the next one also, and uh, club rating. Um, and uh, two other like classification, uh, two other groups, uh, key characteristics, so the coordinates uh, from where the goal was scored, and uh, XG. And the player characteristics, uh, whether a player start, start in the previous current match and uh, his position. Uh, so that's all for the classification, of course, uh, and uh, our dependent variable. We, uh, what do we want? We want to see, um, uh, we want to see uh, uh, whether uh, uh, a coach uh, uh, put a player in the starting squad for the next match uh, more often in the case of specific uh, type of goals. In this uh, case is decisive goal. So, uh, of course, the dependent variable is uh, an indicator of a player's appearance in the starting lineup for the next match. And uh, additional like data selection process, like we excluded observations from the first and last matches of each season due to reliance on variables containing information about previous and subsequent matches for each observation. So you can remember like the next match and previous match. Like, so that's why we can't uh, take uh, the, our data sets first and last uh, matches. Uh, and uh, we also consider only players who scored exactly one goal per match to avoid ambiguity when a player scores both a decisive and non-decisive goal in a match or both non-decisive goals in a match. So because we want to, um, to, to, to catch the effect of a decisive goal, like the average treatment effects, we, we don't want like these ambiguities. Uh, and additional, that said, FIFA ratings of the players sourced from FIFA.com. Uh, it isn't included in our main specification, but it is. Uh, the results are robust uh, with, uh, with this um, when including the FIFA rating. Now there is a relatively huge uh, section about causal inference tools. Uh, then uh, the estimation uh, and model. Sorry, the model, uh, the choice of model, uh, and uh, the choice of estimator. Um, it's a very uh, important uh, section of our um, st uh, study because uh, uh, we need to make sure that everything is fine. So, okay, we use the Rubin causal model. This section explains the causal inference tools we're using to estimate the ATE average treatment effect and conditional average treatment effect. Uh, special attention is given to the model's assumption because they can be easily misleading. And what are these three assumptions I was talking about? Unconfoundedness, existence of overlap, fulfillment of the stable unit treatment value assumption, uh, in the future I'll uh, say just SUTVA. Uh, and we need to ensure that these three assumptions are met. Uh, and we design our research and provide necessity checks to ensure these assumptions are met. So, the first assumptions, uh, assumption, unconfoundedness. Uh, let E represents the observation and XE is the set of pretreatment covariates for observation E. 
Z e uh, Z e is the treatment indicator for observation e, where Z e equals one is a player score that's sizable and zero as otherwise. E group e is the binary outcome, so whether a player appeared in the starting squad for the next match. And uh, E group e from one and zero are the potential outcomes for observation e if the player scored a decisive or a non-decisive goal. Uh, uh, so. What's the definition of unconfoundedness? After controlling for the pretreatment covariate 6C, we assume that the treatment assignment is independent of the potential outcomes. And uh, here you can see this definition with uh, quantors. Uh, this is often referred to as the assumption of non measured confounders, so the strong ignorability assumption proposed by Rubin. And uh, it's very difficult to ensure that this assumption uh, met because Otherwise, we won't uh, estimate the average treatment effect and like the research wouldn't be so nice, you know. Uh, and uh, in our case, like I told you all these things, uh, we are taking uh, the set of covariates which uh, were in the in the previous tables, like uh, match characteristics, kick characteristics and player characteristics. And uh, these confounders may affect the outcome the probability of appearance in the starting squad for in the next match, and treatment assignment, scoring a specific type of goal. So that is why it's uh, pretty much important to include all these variables, all this type of variables in our analysis. So there are no actually uh, any other confounders which affect both the outcome and the treatment assignment. So yeah, to minimize the risk, of an observed variables that could influence both the treatment assignment and the outcome, one can consider all three types of confounders we identified. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, there may be some unmeasured or measured confounders we haven't included in our analysis, but we like uh, thought about it uh, pretty much pretty, like, uh, obviously there may be some, theoretically. And uh, this is the field for the future research. Like someone would find it, and it uh, impacts the results. Like uh, this is like the case for the future research. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what's the definition of a decisive goal? Again, it is a goal scored when the score was equal. There was a draw in the match, and no goals were scored after. In contrast, a non-decisive goal is one scored when the score is equal, but later one of the teams score a goal. So, like the, after after controlling uh, after controlling for all these uh, confounders, we uh, can say that uh, after controlling this, we like uh, don't don't see any differences between decisive and non-decisive goals. Like, of course, uh, initially, uh, these samples are very different because decisive goals happened uh, um, lately in the match and so on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, including controlling for these variables, it's a must have. So, uh, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, the second assumption, uh, the second assumption is overlap. Uh, each unit in the population has a non-zero probability of receiving each treatment. So in our case, receiving a treatment, each treatment is scoring a decisive goal or scoring a non-decisive goal. So uh, this was like the, um, the term, uh, the, the, this definition was proposed uh, by uh, Rosenbaum, like of propensity score. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, E represents an observation again and X represents a set of covariates. So uh, probability of scoring a decisive goal based on uh, a specific uh, type, uh, on the specific uh, set of covariates uh, is called the probability, yeah, that unit E received the treatment ZE equals one. So it is the propensity score. Uh, and we need to ensure that this is uh, not close to one or zero. Um, um, and we'll provide the propensity score distributions for all the goal types later in the appendix section. And uh, in the following analysis, we'll also trim units based on their propensity scores to avoid working with units whose probabilities are close to one or zero, as suggested by Crump and Yan and Dean. So our third assumption, Sutva. Uh, I told you about this. Uh, so in our design, 
we need to ensure that this sutva holds. What, what actually does it mean, you may ask? This means that a player's appearance in the starting squad shouldn't be affected by, others players, by other players receiving treatment, scoring a certain type of goal. So, uh, like, what, what, um, how can this suit be violated? Uh, firstly, we need to make some assumptions. Uh, we assume that the coach's decision making isn't influenced by players' goals from matches involving other clubs or by previous matches of the same team, except for the most recent match in which the goal was scored. Um, secondly, there may be cases where there are multiple observations goals from one match with players from the same team. In this case, Sutva, of course, is violated and we can't analyze the entire data set. Why? Because, for example, there may be uh, like there were three goals in a match and all these three goals were scored by three forwards uh, but some of them initially uh, were at the bench and uh, the probability of appearing in the starting squad for uh, for the forward depends on the uh, depends on the performance of other forwards so Sutva is violated and we need to isolate, uh, like, uh, we need to extract the situations. But how can we do it? We propose the following solution. We will use observations from only those matches where players from the same position didn't score a goal. So, for example, we can consider a match where there was a goal by a defender, by a midfielder and by a forward. And, yeah, uh, in our case, we will consider this um, match. But uh, a match where, the, for example, there was... Uh, at, uh, two goals uh, by midfielders, we won't consider this match. So, why do we do so? Uh, why? Uh, so, in soccer positions are interchangeable and the left winger can play as a right winger. So, we categorize all players into three groups, defenders, midfielders and forwards. We assume, so, yeah, this is what I've told you. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, therefore, like, if we assume that players from different positions do not compete with each other, Sutva isn't violated. So this assumption is, uh, this assumption is met and uh, like the estimator, uh, the average treatment effect estimator, like, uh, sorry, like the, uh, the effect we will found uh, is uh, the ATI uh, average treatment effect, not something else. So this approach of considering a subset, separating the observations into several clusters and only considering observations where at most one player did something like uh, a goal or something else in a match can be applied in many soccer and other sports settings. And future analysis and team sports may consider this implementation to support Sutva. So, uh, like, you can uh, find uh, several subsets where the Sutva isn't violated. And uh, it can be done uh, pretty much often. For, for, um, for, uh, yeah. Can I interrupt, can I interrupt you? you? Danielle yeah. has a question. Yeah. So, um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, this is an interesting approach, but one could think of taking the exact opposite approach of what you're doing, which is looking only at two players in the same position one of which scored a decisive goal, one which scored a non-decisive goal in the same match, and then you can control for match-fixed effects. Um, it's, it's almost exactly the opposite assumption. It's saying, well, you know, two forwards, one scores the goal that puts the team ahead 2-1, the other one puts the nail in the coffin, makes the goal 3-1, you know, does the player who scored the 2-1 you know, uh, is you know he more likely to be selected for the uh, for the next match? And uh, you know, I think uh, it's a possibility. I'd be interested in seeing what those results look like as well. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I think it's possible. Um, I don't know about the size of this uh, subsample. So, like, uh, maybe the size of this subsample may be uh, not not so big to conduct. Uh, uh, a, a nice analysis, but I think, uh, yes, yeah, so maybe I should try this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so next slide, if there are no any other questions. Um, 
Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, however, in some situations it's impossible to find several clusters to consider a subset where SUTVA holds, or the subset uh, contains too few observations for a meaningful interpretation of the results. So in this case, uh, researchers may consider working with interference and can refer to the works of Aronov and Sami and Chedkin and Van der Wille. Um, I hope I don't pronounce them wrong. Uh, in some studies, researchers may find a way to separate the data into few clusters, where observations may affect each other within a cluster, but not between clusters. In these scenarios, researchers may also use double robust estimators in a more complex manner, CLEO. So, and a small spoiler, uh, in our study we use a uh, double robust estimator, AIPW also, but uh, not in a more complex manner, uh, because like we found a way to, to make this subset where uh, there are enough uh, observations to conduct a causal inference uh, study. So um, we are moving on to the model and estimator selection. One, uh, w once again, I'll uh, repeat uh, like the unit of our analysis, the treatment, and then we'll like quickly move to, on to the estimator and the, the final the results which we're waiting for. So uh, the unit of analysis is a player who scored a goal in a match. The treatment that e is an indicator equal to one if players scored a decisive goal and zero otherwise. The outcome is a binary variable equal to one if a player is included in the starting spot of the next match. And our goal is to estimate the causal effect of scoring a decisive goal on coach's initial decision to include a player in the starting squad and to connect this effect to potential coach bias. Uh, we are interested in the initial co uh, coach decision, so we don't uh, consider a uh, dependent variable as a number of pinots uh, played by a player, as in Gorio uh, and Page uh, study. Because, uh, uh, for example, a player who scored a specific type of goal uh, can uh, perform better in the next match. Hence, uh, a coach uh, will give him uh, more time on the, on the field. So, but we're interested in the initial decision of the coach, not the sum of effects of uh, player's performance and coach's decision. So we are taking this binary variable, uh, like whether a player um, is included in the starting squad or not. So, uh, yeah, uh, implementation of the double robust estimator. Uh, yeah, uh, so we like, our main purpose is to address the peculiarities of, uh, of soccer and other sports by implementing the Rubel causal model. And uh, uh, we like provide several suggestions on the design that researchers need to include in their studies to support the suit and anticapandonous assumption. And our goal system is to estimate the Atelier, year, delve into the KT, estimations for covariates such as club strength and the likelihood that the goal was decisive and recognize that the treatment effect may vary. So, choice of estimator. We implemented the augmented inverse propensity weighted estimator, uh, which is uh, well known for its double robust uh, property. Uh, so, uh, it performs just better than propensity score matching, regression adjustment, and inverse propensity weighting. Nearest uh, neighbor matching, for, for example, in our case, uh, can be applicable because uh, there are so many covariates, so it can't uh, just perform well, the matching won't be good. So, um, uh, many researchers use regression adjustment, but uh, its um, uh, estimations may be biased in several cases. Uh, that's why, like, uh, augmented inverse propensity weighted uh, is well known for its, like, um, for its like uh, unbi unbiased uh, uh, properties, yeah, and uh, it is even uh, unbiased uh, with practical sample sizes, as uh, shown by uh, Lanserford and uh, Davidia. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, there are various, many uh, studies uh, which focused on uh, various double robust estimators, for example, IPWRA, uh, but uh, it's like. We, we won't uh, delve deep uh, into this theoretical framework. Yeah. Uh, so this is the AIPW double robust estimator. Uh, again, there are many like beautiful properties of this one, but uh, all uh, is uh, all we're interested in are the first line of the equation corresponds to the basic inverse prop propensity weighted estimator, and the second line adjusts this estimator by a weighted average of the two regressions. So it's uh, like 
uh, it like it takes the best from two methods, IPW and uh, regression adjustment. Uh, so that is why it's like a double robust because uh, if uh, at least one of these models is specified correctly, then um, the estimator isn't uh, uh, biased, uh, and so this is why it uh, it is very uh, very popular. Yeah. Uh, so the probability score here is estimated uh, using a logit uh, model with a set of covariate six from those tables like match, uh, player, and key characteristics. So, like, it's um, a simple uh, logit model, like, uh, for, for, and the dependent variables is, is whether a goal is decisive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, we, we are moving on to our, like, uh, last half, uh, second half uh, presentation. So, estimation results. So the next table on the, on the next page contains the results of implementing this double robust estimator. We use various specifications, different outcome models, uh, and trimming based on the propensity score to provide robust results. On average, a player who scored a goal when the score was equal and subsequently no other goals were scored, that is again a definition for a decisive goal, has a three percentage point higher chance of appearing in the starting squad lineup, oh, sorry, in the starting lineup for the next match compared to a situation in which at least one goal was scored subsequently. It is a definition of a non decisive goal. So, like, it gives us around, like, four, almost 4% 4 uh, at a year, and it is, uh, this estimation is consistent. So, here's the results. Uh, here are the results. Yeah, so you can see, like, in the first specifications, we are using the outcome model li linear by maximum uh, likelihood. And in two to fourth specifications, we are using linear by WNLS. Um, also, you can see that PS score interval varies in the, especially in the third and fourth uh, specifications. Uh, um, yeah. So as we can see, the results are pretty much robust. P value like uh, a little bit less than 005 uh, in most of the specifications. Um, and uh, like PO means PO mean like means that uh, uh, if uh, all the goals uh, were non-decisive, even that were decisive, like if all all the goals will be uh, non-decisive, then uh, these players will uh, be uh, will appear in the starting squad for the next match in 80% of the cases, and. Uh, if all the goals were decisive in 83% of the cases. Yeah, so PO mean plus ATE. Um, ATE, I, I, I don't know like how to pronounce, sorry. Uh, so yeah, uh, we can see that the result is persistent and uh, it, 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 it's real. <laughs> like, uh, and the uh, factors influencing the coefficient because of course we're interested not only in the ATE but in uh, KATE. Uh, so we want to investigate the factors influencing the coefficient. And we examine its impact based on various continuous variables, firstly club level and then propensity score. Uh, so we analyzed various subsets with low level clubs and found that the effect of scoring the decisive goal, Kate, is stronger in low level clubs. So you can see that in top 10% lowest clubs by level, the absolute effect is almost 10%, which gives us like another year of uh, 14 percent, which is huge. Uh, conversely, in the top 30 percent, the effect is a little bit less. And estimations from the outcome model estimator like uh, suggest that the effect is more pronounced in weaker clubs with a p-value of 0, 0, 0,01. So uh, there are two um, different um, uh, options to um, analyze the effect of uh, of a continuous variable. So uh, looking at uh, several subsets and uh, looking at uh, the main uh, uh, results of the of running the AIPW estimator yeah and so the effect uh, for for the club strength there like uh, with the p value of 0, zero 01 of course with the positive slope uh, with the negative slope the uh, stronger the club the weaker the effect so uh, and this result aligns with findings from Meyer Flap and Frank Indicating that with the weaker clubs may exhibit a more pronounced effect due to a coach's potentially heightened irrational behavior. And so here's the table. Um, 
So as you can see, yeah, uh, the PS uh, PS score interval uh, remains the same, and club level we increase. Oh, sorry, we decrease uh, the threshold for the club level, and the less it is, like less than one, it's a normalized variable. Uh, less than one, then less than minus zero point five, less than minus one, the less the club level, the more the effect. So. Uh, uh, as you can see, with the, in the third specifications, there are like only 360 observations. But of course, we checked for uh, balance. Uh, there were some balance checks, and uh, uh, the control and treatment uh, uh, samples uh, were balanced. So of course, uh, we checked for this, uh, and everything seems fine. Um, yeah, but of course we can see that standard errors are huge, uh, especially the third uh, specification, but uh, still uh, gives us uh, a positive, oh, sorry, a significance. Yeah. Uh, so another interesting thing, uh, what we want to look at uh, is um, decisive goal effect by propensity score. Uh, now let's examine the decisive goal effect based on the propensity score which is the likelihood of scoring a decisive goal based on the list of covariates. So remember those like propensity score log it model. And uh, for each of the observations, we get uh, a probability, a probability that this goal is decisive. And it's very interesting to look at whether uh, uh, like unexpected, this, uh, unexpected goals which, beca which became decisive ones, uh, like are they differ? Uh, sorry, do they differ from uh, from decisive goals, which were like 90, 80, 70 percent uh, uh, decisive? So we expect, theoretically, that the effect kata will be greater in cases where the decisive goal is unexpected, as unexpected actions are more likely to be remembered by the coach. So uh, we analyzed various subsets based on the propensity score and found that the effect of scoring a decisive goal is stronger when the propensity score is low, indicating a more unexpected decisive goal. So, as you can see, three specifications. Uh, the first specification for the probabilities from 50% to 50. The second specification for the probabilities from 50% to 45%. And the third specification for um, uh, the goals, so this is uh, the ATA effect for the goals which were likely to become uh, decisive ones. So from 50 to 85% chance. Uh, I will show you later the uh, distribution, uh, sorry, the, the overlap of uh, decisive and non decisive goals uh, and their propensity score. There are no observations uh, with less than 15% and with more than 85%. So that is why I'm using these thresholds as uh, the left and the right ones. Uh, so we can see that the effect for small probabilities for the unexpected uh, decisive goals is huge. And for the not unexpected decisive goals, it's small. Yeah, so it's uh, consistent with our uh, with our ideas, like with, uh, sorry, with our, th with our uh, theory which was on the previous slide, yeah. Um, so that is that is all on the analysis of the decisive goals. Um, that's almost uh, all. So uh, there is a slide like an analysis of home and away goals. Uh, we analyzed the potential differences in coaches' attitudes towards players who scored in home matches versus away matches. Uh, and research suggests that home teams often perform better in various game characteristics, such as attacking more, shooting more often, and scoring more goals, uh, even uh, in the absence of uh, fans on uh, during the COVID. But, uh, and we explore whether coaches might value an away goal more than a home goal due to its like relative uh, statistical difficulty. And despite some findings showing a 10% significance, for the positive effect for, of an away goal, uh, these results aren't robust. So, uh, aren't robust at all, I would say. And no definitive conclusion can be drawn. Uh, yeah, so p-hacking isn't the best solution, so it's like uh, uh, like no significance. And uh, like this hypothesis is rejected, uh, that uh, the effect of an away goal uh, persists. Uh, so, 
and also there is a problem with the lack of overlap. I will show you later in the appendix section. So um, overlap should exist, but there, like you will see. Yeah. And uh, so uh, this uh, lack of overlap resulted in a small subset. So like that's why uh, we uh, couldn't um, can, uh, couldn't uh, analyze like couldn't make a nice uh, like an, an analysis of, of for this uh, research question. So yeah, that's almost all. Like two slides for discussion and one slide for conclusion. So our recommendations. Uh, one outcome of our paper is the recommendation to apply double robust estimators. For example, AIPW, there are also IPWRA, but uh, it's like uh, less popular. Uh, but then sports economics, of course, I mean, uh, to apply this uh, double robust estimator. Uh, when implementing the Rubin causal model, uh, one needs to ensure set uh, suitable holes. Uh, also, you need uh, include covariates from various characteristics, player, match, kick, to address the unconfoundedness assumption. Use double robust estimators carefully to balance che to balance checks, overlap, and robustness across various specifications. Uh, uh, delving into KT estimations is another valuable suggestion because it's interesting. Uh, so understanding the covariates driving the effect can greatly benefit uh, future research. And in our study, the decisive goal effect is more pronounced in weaker clubs and unexpected situations. Also, estimating KT based on propensity score like provides intuitive and useful results. Uh, then, like. Cognitive, uh, like our research supports the idea of cognitive biases among sports agents, particularly football coaches, and future studies should explore heuristics and specific biases and identify uh, other covariates driving the effect of rationality. Future research should use flexible machine learning methods instead of traditional logging models for estimating treatment likelihood and linear models for predicting outcomes. So this approach known as double machine learning uses more flexible methods. So simply put, like we just uh, um, take out uh, the log it, like uh, the, the log it model, uh, uh, make like uh, add uh, decision trees uh, and uh, or, like and uh, change the outcome model, uh, for example, gradient boosting. Uh, so to uh, and or to decision trees, yeah, so to better conduct causal inference. Um, and the DML allows for more accurate estimations of not only at the at the but also at the with continuous variables, because as we can see here, like um, watching it like uh, subgroups, uh, it's, it's a robust method when we use like various uh, intervals and so on, uh, but um, uh, to catch, uh, like for example, a polynomial function, uh, like you, you better should use like DML for the for this purpose. Like if if you um, if you um, if you expect to see this uh, complex um, relation. Uh, and so conclusion, like we found a positive three four percent effect of scoring a decisive goal on the likelihood of starting in the next game. This effect is particularly pronounced in weaker teams. That can reach up to like almost okay 15 percent yeah in the top 10 percent of the lowest clubs by level and conversely in the top 30 percent of the lowest club the effect is like almost eight percent um the effect is stronger for unexpected decisive goals suggesting that unexpected actions are more memorable for the coaches and our findings like overall they support the presence of coach bias in sports literature and provide additional evidence of heuristic decision making in sports so, uh, place for uh, these questions. So, like, um, yeah, you're free to ask uh, several questions. And here, are, like, uh, the appendix, like, uh, overlap for decisive goals and uh, for uh, for home goals. As you can see here, the overlap is like this op zero 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 almost zero op. Uh, yeah, because uh, the logit model wasn't very nice at uh, predicting. Yes, like, something like this happens. Yeah. So that's all. Yeah, you're free to ask uh, questions. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. I'm just going to give you a team's round of applause. Uh, and we can uh, open up the floor, the virtual floor, to questions. If anyone has any uh, questions or comments they would like to ask Andrew, please do raise your hand and go ahead. Daniele. 
Yeah, hi, Andre. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, so um, there's one thing I'm not sure I understood, and um, if I did understand it, I'd like you to, to do so. Uh, a so suppose that the score is one one, and then you know player A scores a goal, and then that that's the size of goal. So the match ends two one. That's considered a size of goal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, alternative scenario: player A scores a goal. The score you know becomes two one, mm -hmm. and then there are two possibilities: either player A's team scores another goal and the score becomes 3-1. And so player A's goal becomes non-decisive. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Or the other team scores a goal. So the score mm -hmm. ends up being 2-2. And so player A's goal is non-decisive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so both those two types of non-decisive goals are included in your sample. Uh, right? You're not conditioning on what the... The final outcome of the matches. No, no, I'm uh, conditioning on the final outcome. Like as you can see, one second. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So this subset includes the final subset for the analysis includes only goals scored during a draw. Uh, during no, uh, where the team. No, when, so the during a draw is a little bit confusing. You mean when the match is tied? When the match is yeah. at, at the yeah, moment yeah. of the goal, the match was tied. It's yeah. not the final outcome of the match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the team subsequently won. So uh, And the team subsequently wins. So the second type that I described is not included. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't included in the analysis. But the first one is included as a non-decisive goal. I see. What if you include that second type of goals? So, uh, you know, two players, you know, we I score a goal in the 75th minute, puts my team up to one. Mm -hmm. And then something happens, you know, in one case, my team concedes an equalizer, and in the other case, my team doesn't concede an equalizer. I had still scored a goal that put the team up to one in the 75th minute. Why don't I want to compare, you know, those two things? Yeah, so uh, first of all, like, the effect of a decisive goal was still significant, but um, uh, in the final like, specification, we decided to uh, exclude uh, all the matches uh, where the team uh, didn't uh, didn't win, uh, because uh, uh, for, in the cases when there was a decisive goal, the team uh, all always uh, win wins. In the case of a decisive goal, a team yeah. wins always. So uh, theoretically, there may be uh, a coach bias, for example, that uh, players uh, players uh, like. Often, uh, more often appear in the starting squad when uh, uh, they uh, won in the previous match. In, com uh, in, uh, okay. in compared to the case when they uh, okay, I, I understand the rationale for that. I would still be curious to see those results if you if you can show that. I understand why it's you know it's more difficult to interpret because it's the combination of the goal being yeah. non-decisive and the team didn't win. So perhaps you want to make changes to the lineup because the team didn't win. Mm -hmm. um, if I can ask us an, an additional question, uh, you can. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you, when you do the heterogeneity, uh, I'd be curious it looking, and maybe that's sort of subsumed in the propensity score, like the ones with high probability of being decisive versus not. Uh, but maybe a more transparent way of showing that is goals that were scored, say, in the first half versus the second half. Uh, somehow you would think that the coach bias is more prominent if it's a decisive goal scored in the final minutes of the match versus a, you know a decisive goal scored at the beginning of the match, and so that would be you know something to look at as well. Yeah, like uh, at first when uh, like I came up with the idea of like the effect of scoring a decisive goal, I thought that uh, the the most pronounced uh, effect will be at uh, the home stadium. Uh, in the end of the match, when th th this is a decisive goal, but unfortunately, uh, we can't um, provide a, like the um, the the sample is uh, very small, so uh, we. If you break if you break it down by first half versus second half, you should have enough. Ah, uh, yeah, by first half and second half, yeah, it's okay, but uh, there we, uh, like there is no significance. Uh, yeah, but I can check it. But uh, if you are talking about like the last uh, 10 minutes of the game, for example, uh, like yeah. the analysis, like can it be done? 
with, yeah. with this method. I mean, I, I think it would be, you know, if you can show something in a way that, you know, you have enough sample size comparing sort of early versus late goals, that would be useful. Mm -hmm. And maybe but, there's no difference. And that's also something important to know. Okay. Okay, those were my questions. Great, thanks, Daniele. I might just add on the point about decisive goals, Andre. Um, in my mind, a decisive goal changes the outcome of the game. So my team could be losing 1-0 and the last minute scores an equalising goal and the game finishes one all, And to me, that's a decisive goal because it's changed the outcome of the game from a defeat to a draw. Uh, and it might also, you know, have a similar kind of effect on the coach's subsequent decision making. So, I mean, I think I understand that that wouldn't be considered a decisive goal by your definition. Yeah, we consider only goals that like uh, became the, the winning ones. Yeah, yeah. not, not yeah. the draw. Yeah. Because I mean, one the, the only thing I'd kind of say on top of that is this: it may be that the adage isn't the same in other countries, but certainly here in in England, it's very common that people will say, "Well, you should never change a winning team." You know, so if your team has won a game, you shouldn't change the team, and this is a big kind of belief, um, you know, a heuristic type thing. Uh, and so, given that your measure um, is always resulting in a team winning. It might be quite interesting to look at the distinction between, you know, if the decisive goal then includes goals that pull a team to a draw, and then the manager's free to change the team because they didn't win, um, but perhaps that player who scored the decisive goal to get the draw uh, might get more favourable treatment. That's just a just a. I don't know whether you're able to uh, analyse that potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can try it. Thank you. More questions and comments? Looks like a no. Um, nope, Daniele, just in time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I'm just looking at the you know other possible interesting dimensions of heterogeneity. Um, so perhaps I you know is there are there differences between say midfielders, forwards, and you know defenders? Is the effect more pronounced for one group versus the other? I imagine that you know forwards score more goals, and so the sample size of forwards is is going to be bigger. Um, actually, or maybe yeah, not. But yeah, yeah, the sample sizes for forwards is it's slightly for bigger than everybody else. So, um, you know, if a descent defender scored a decisive goal, it's not clear that the coach really would want to, you know, put that much weight on. You know, I would expect the you know a rational coach should not put that much weight on that, right? But maybe not. So I, that would be again. I, I think that you know some of these things are embodied in your heterogeneity by propensity score, but I think that's a little bit not really transparent what, what goes on there. And so I think that, you know, doing heterogeneity by characteristics that are easier to, uh, you know, to understand, uh, I think that would make things clearer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Daniele. Any more final last moment questions or comments? Decisive questions and comments might be most memorable because they're very late in proceedings. Well, thank you very much, Andre. That was a really interesting talk uh, on these kinds of managerial biases. Uh, really interesting uh, to think a bit more uh, deeply about these kinds of um, outcomes and decisions and influences on uh, decisions. So thank you very much for what was a really uh, interesting talk and I wish you well as you uh, continue your studies uh, and uh, look forward to your future presentations uh, in this format uh, and in uh, digital conferences uh, in the future.
Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. We will be back again next week on August the 9th. Uh, and that talk will be by uh, Oliver Gertler uh, from the University of uh, Cologne, uh, who is presenting player strength and effort in contests. So uh, I wish you all a fantastic weekend and look forward to seeing you all again this time next week. Thanks very much. Thanks.